Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we continue the conversation about commodity chains, but expand it to the scope of a global scale. No single country produces all of the food its population consumes. There are several reasons for this. Maybe their climate isn't conducive to specific crops, or perhaps it's cheaper to import food from another country that specializes in growing certain food more efficiently. That efficiency is often a product of economies of scale, as we discussed earlier. Take a look at the map of exports from the United States. What do you notice? Do you see features of economic development associated with our trade partners? Do you notice the influence of distance decay? Are there any other factors that influence who purchases the greatest amount of agricultural goods from the United States? As an example, China has become one of the hottest markets for consuming chicken because there have been considerable growth in the number of people in the middle class in China as economic development there improves. So China has seen tremendous increases in the imports of chickens as a result. Another example to include is that nearly half of all US grown soybeans are exported to countries like China, Mexico, and Europe. So let's look at how this happens and the impact it has. We discussed commodity chains earlier, and the global supply chain is basically a commodity chain, but it's organized at, you guessed it, the global scale, often by transnational agribusinesses. Production and consumption are part of a complex global supply chain. Often crops are grown in peripheral countries and harvested using low cost local labor, which reduces the overall cost. The processing is often done in periphery or semi-periphery countries before they're transported for consumption around the world. Let's look at coffee as a bit of a case study. There are multiple steps in the global supply chain for coffee. Coffee was first domesticated in East Africa. Today, raw coffee cherries are grown in tropical climates, primarily in Middle and South America, like this plantation in Costa Rica, but also in Southeast Asia and Ethiopia, often on agribusiness-owned plantations. Farmers then sell them to a mill where they're processed, like this dry mill in Ethiopia. Then the coffee beans are packaged and exported for consumption. Countries will import the raw coffee beans and more than half of the coffee that is sold on world markets today is exported to the United States with much of the rest going to Western Europe. But they still need to be roasted at a roastery before they can be brewed and consumed. Roasteries like this one in New York then sell it to supermarkets, restaurants, and coffee shops, like this one in Las Vegas, Nevada, where they're then sold to consumers who drink it. Now that we've seen how the global supply chain works for coffee, let's take a look at some other examples and processes. Coffee is an example of a luxury crop or non-subsistence crops such as tea, cacao, coffee, and tobacco. Luxury crops are crops that are not essential to human survival, but have a high profit margin. These crops are sometimes called cash crops because these export commodities are produced with the intent to export them to wealthier countries. This generates revenue from the sale of these relatively expensive luxury crops. Oftentimes, to generate the most money, farmers will produce an abundance of a single commodity to benefit from economies of scale, reducing their costs while maximizing output to generate the most profit. 
We see this with cacao in Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire, vanilla in Madagascar, cotton in Mozambique, and tea in Sri Lanka as specific examples. But we also see some broad patterns like bananas, sugar, coffee, and cacao from Middle and South America, rubber, cacao, and tea from West and East Africa, and rubber from Southeast Asia. And as you can see here, it isn't just agriculture that economies can be dependent on. Countries in the Middle East, as well as countries like Russia and Norway, are heavily dependent on revenue from petroleum and gas, or minerals like gold, diamonds, iron ore, or other mining products. But let's look at cacao a little closer. For example, the cocoa bean, which is the fruit of the cacao, is too bitter to be consumed in its raw form. Cocoa represents more than 50% of Cote d'Ivoire's exports. Processing and manufacturing of the plants throughout the world turns the bean into cocoa powder, which is used to make baking chocolate, chocolate bars, and other products. Like coffee, most chocolate products end up in the United States and Europe. Countries like Germany, the UK, Belgium, the Netherlands, and France import large amounts of chocolate, which are then sold to consumers with enough disposable income to buy this luxury. When a country's economy is heavily dependent on a single export cash crop, as Cote d'Ivoire is with cocoa, we call this commodity dependence. The benefits are obvious because countries can reap tremendous profits from the sale of these commodities on the global market. But when they are dependent on a commodity, what happens when people stop buying that commodity? It can be very risky during economic downturns, which the world saw in the 1980s with cocoa. We also see that other countries may attempt to get in on lucrative markets. For example, many islands in the Caribbean were forced to grow sugarcane during the colonial period. In fact, 80 to 90% of the sugar consumed in Western Europe came from the Caribbean. But Brazil and India have emerged as the leading sugarcane producers today. And Caribbean countries struggled as they transitioned to economies that are now dominated by tourism. It also leaves a country vulnerable if crops fail, whether that failure comes from drought, extreme temperatures, storms or natural disasters, or climate change. In addition, as countries focus on export commodities, farmland is being used for those luxury crops rather than for food. This can mean food deprivation for the local community or that local food prices may increase and become too expensive, limiting nutritional diversity. In addition, since many of the decisions are coming from international agribusinesses, the best farmland is used for cash crops, while more marginal land or more isolated land is used for local food production. And more land is being cleared for lucrative export commodities. Forests are being cut down, water is overused or polluted, soil declines in fertility or is eroded as farmers try to extract the highest yield. And in the rainforests of South America, that land doesn't remain productive for long. So cattle ranching, also for export, is increasingly becoming the commodity that countries like Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay are dependent on. We'll finish up tonight by looking at some of the elements that influence global networks of food distribution. We'll start with the influence of political relationships within and between countries. Governmental decision making can impact the type and quantity of agricultural products and where in the world they go. The legacy of colonialism impacts the types of commodities that countries are still growing. And even though most colonies have gained independence, many former colonies retain trade relationships with their former colonizers. Oftentimes, the former colony, 
typically a periphery country, produces commodities and sell them to the former colonizer, typically a core country. Oftentimes, the process of adding value takes place in the core country while limited revenue returns to the former colony, which can maintain unequal relationships in what is called neocolonialism. And within the United States, the U.S. subsidy system heavily subsidizes large-scale commercial farms who can produce significantly more than the smaller family farmers who have very limited land. And other countries may permit dramatic landscape change to promote agricultural production. Indonesia and Malaysia have seen considerable deforestation as multinational corporations have pushed for larger palm oil plantations. And there are a couple other contemporary relationships that bear keeping an eye on. The implications of Brexit could have major implications on Britain's agricultural supply chain. They import many fruits and vegetables from mainland Europe, which may change with increasing time from the UK's exit from the EU. And trade wars like the one in 2018 that occurred between the United States and China can affect both import and export supply chains, leading to changes in cost, available supply, and consumer demand. Infrastructure obviously impacts the ability for agricultural products to move around the world. Infrastructure is the stock of basic facilities and capital equipment needed for the functioning of a country or area. These are the roads, bridges, ports, and telecommunication systems that help to produce, but especially distribute, crops and livestock to global markets. In former colonies, the foundations of infrastructure were not designed to aid the local population, but rather to exploit the natural resources in the colony as they were transported to ports and exported to European countries. In developing countries, they may not have the money to improve bad roads or unreliable electrical systems. This contributes to food insecurity, hunger, and malnutrition. But core countries are willing to provide financial support to improve infrastructure in periphery and semi-periphery countries, which can tend to benefit both countries. Improvements in infrastructure can lead to greater agricultural exports, less food loss, and a reduction in cost of food for local consumption. We saw this with the introduction of refrigerated railroad cars and later refrigerated ships that allowed beef and other meat to travel longer distances and reach more consumers. Finally, we will examine some patterns associated with global trade that impacts our agricultural system. Trade in food alone has nearly doubled since 1995. Regional trade agreements like NAFTA previously, or the USMCA currently, or the creation of the European Union have helped to reduce or eliminate taxes on imported goods that can serve as a barrier to trade. Developed countries will tend to export a larger share of the food needs to developing countries and import larger quantities of fruits and vegetables from tropical and subtropical countries. Semi-periphery countries like Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, and Russia account for significant growth in the global food trade as their economies have grown. Regional specialization occurs as places produce agricultural products in which they have a comparative advantage in different crops. Comparative advantage leads to a greater diversity of foods and a lower price than if everything was sourced locally. Global trade can help farmers in developing countries earn more money and expand their operations. That expansion, though, can have environmental impacts like consumption of water resources for irrigation as farmers work to produce enough for global markets. We'll continue to examine some of the consequences of agriculture as we move forward. But for now, that's where we'll end our discussion. Have a good evening, everyone, and I'll see you back in class.